Good afternoon. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Annette Letty of the Getty Research Institute. Welcome to session two, Surrealist Love Letters, the art and poetry of Cesar Moro. Cesar Moro wrote much of his poetry in French. Very little of it has been translated into English, and even though it has been translated into Spanish, it is not well known outside of Peru. For this reason, I'm gonna read you an English translation of the poem, Pierre Mer, that Kent Dixon and I made with a little help from Rebecca Peabody and Danielle Garcia Biaga for this symposium. And on the screen are the French and Spanish versions of it. And any eccentricities in the poem's grammar and punctuation are moros. Mother Stone, <clears throat> you, like me, have a lifeless stone eye. Like me, you dream of a cataclysm. In dampness, drought, or indifferent weather, the same thirst oppresses us. Similar destiny, the earth, the tedium. For too long I have watched you, O oh stone, here I am in exile, speaking a language of stone into the ears of the wind. In infinite time, tears have dried, but what wound does our world, <coughs> world conceal? Only the night loves us. You repose in its coolness. It is the moment when I can join you and abandon what is left of my life to all the eternal damnations. Don Addis, our first speaker, was introduced this morning, but if you've just joined us, she is a professor at the University of Essex, an art historian, writer, and curator. Her exhibitions include Dada and Surrealism Reviewed, Art in Latin America, and Francis Bacon, as well as the highly successful 2004 exhibition celebrating the centenary of Salvador Dali. Her books cover subjects such as photomontage, Dada, Surrealism, Women Artists, and Mexican Muralists. She will speak on Cesar Moro and Surrealism in Latin America. Thank you, Annette. Um, This is an introduction to César Moreau, whose name crops up sporadically and in different contexts in the history of surrealism in Europe and in Latin America. But it's quite hard to get an overall picture. His indifference, opposition really, to the powerful cultural nationalisms in Latin America and his migratory life, I call it that rather than exile because exile implies a home and I'm not sure he ever really had one. And his migratory life have contributed to his relative neglect. I've put up here a snapshot on the left of uh, Cesar Moro, one of those wonderful street snapshots of the 1940s, of Moro with Alice Palen, or Alice Raon, uh, who you see again on the top right, and uh, Villa Rutia below. Um, these two on the right come from a volume of photographic portraits of writers and artists in Mexico by his friend, the photographer, Lola Alvarez Bravo, which included two of his closest friends, Alice Raon and Xavier Villarutia, but not Moro, despite the fact that he'd been a significant figure in Mexico in the 1940s. Now, this is not going to be an attempt uh, to map the workings of surrealism, its isolated eruptions or extended networks within Latin America as a whole. I'm just going to look at Moreau's particular involvement in surrealism, in its reception in Latin America, and at his eventual withdrawal from it. His birth name was Alfredo Quispes Asin, and he wrote most of his poetry and the vast majority of his letters in French, not in Spanish. So there's clearly, uh, a, a, as it were, a, a, a resistance to a sort of definite identity as a Peruvian poet. 
His meager, modest autobiographical note, which you see here, mentions his expulsion from the Jesuit college in Lima, a foretaste of his violent and unchanging anti-clericalism, on a par with that of his friend, the surrealist poet, uh, Benjamin Perret. And I put up a little uh, tag, in a sense, from the, from the notes here. We who have neither church nor country, we who desert the armies of the world. And those were sentiments that Moreau retained throughout his life. He lived at the heart of the Paris Surrealist group in the early 1930s, and his name first appears in association with Surrealism as signatory to the tract Misère de la Poésie in January 1932. I've put up here a postcard that he received um, from all the key figures in this, in, uh, the, of the group, Breton, Valentin Hugo, Éluard, Crevel, and Dali, uh, from the early 1930s, sent from Dali's home village of Port Legat to Moreau in Paris, just simply to demonstrate that he was indeed part of this. And this is the postcard of Cadiquez, where Dali lived in 1932. So, uh, OK. His poem, Renommée d'amour, which you see here, was published in Surrealisme au service de la Révolution, number five, in May 1933. And he was the only Hispanic poet to appear in one of the great interwar surrealist journals. Uh, he added a paragraph to the tract, Mobilization contre, Mobilization contre la Guerre n'est pas la paix, Mobilization against war is not peace, in June 1933, regarding the situation in Peru. And he was uh, charged by Breton with sending it there for distribution. He contributed to the enquête in the sixth issue of Surrealisme et service de la Révolution in 1933 as one of a party of respondents, basically the colonel of the group. Uh, and one of the, uh, the inquiries, the enquête, concerned de Chirico's painting, The Enigma of a Day. And among the questions about this painting were, where is the sea? Where would you make love? Where would you masturbate? And César Moro answered uh, all those very interestingly. Uh, he insisted later on, uh, on, on the importance of de Chirico, writing about him in the post-war reviews as being a painter far more interesting than Miró. He contributed a poem to the Surrealist pamphlet uh, Violette, Violette Nozière, protesting her sentence for killing her father. He organized the first Surrealist exhibition in Latin America in Lima in 1935. He co-edited together with his close friend Emilio Westphalen the Surrealist review El Uso de la Palabra. He organized together with Breton, Breton and Parlen the International Exhibition of Surrealism in Mexico City in 1940 and wrote the preface to the catalogue he contributed in the early 1940s to Parlin's review, Din, which claimed to replace Surrealism. He published with Parlin's help, that, that's his poem from Villette Nozière, uh, which contains some rather obvious puns, but nonetheless, it's interesting. Um, and, and he published with Parlin's help a couple of slim volumes of poetry in Mexico, Le Château de Grisou and Lettre d'Amour, the latter only appearing, I think there were 50 copies of that, and his final appearance in the context of Surrealism was as a respondent to another Surrealist inquiry for André Breton's L'Art Magique in the year that Moreau died, 1956. During the post-war period, that's uh, after 1945, well, from the early 40s, he also contributed articles and translations regularly to the more eclectic avant-garde reviews, notably El Hijo Prodigo in Mexico and Las Moradas in Lima the latter edited by Westphalen. So that's a rough overview of his activities. Pierre Mabille, the Surrealist's doctor, an art lover, an anthropologist, who had spent part of the war in Mexico, in his 1945 text, Personal Message, surveyed the remnants of the Surrealist communities scattered all over the world by the war. Césaire in Martinique, Lam in Cuba, Breton in New York, and so on, and he places Moreau in Mexico with Parlen, Perret, Esteban Frances, and Carrington. And I quote, Cesar Moreau has published a few collections of poems of a very authentic sensibility, expressing the charm of his nature, which is at once refined and intransigent. And the intransigence you will see shows through um, very strongly in the story of his, of his involvement with surrealism. 
this uh, is the cover of the, uh, of the volume Lettres d'Amour, which includes the, uh, as you can see on the left, the original, uh, the, the paste up of uh, all his friends writing love letter, Carta d'Amour. And the one in the center is that of his, from his lover, uh, Antonio. Jason Wilson described Moreau as single-handedly promoting surrealism across the Latin American continent, from Mexico to Peru to Argentina. And others have fastened on his negative review of Breton's Arcandicet in El Hijo Prodigo in 1945, reading this as, as, his, um, as it was a fundamental to his rejection of surrealism uh, because of Breton's homophobia. And I'll come back to this issue, but I don't think it was primarily the cause of his withdrawal from surrealism. A fuller picture is made possible by the Morrow and Westphalen archives in the Getty Research Institute, which contain notebooks, drawings, collages, manuscripts of the shockingly large number of poems that remained unpublished at Morrow's death, his library, and many letters from Morrow in Mexico between 1938 and 1948 to Westphalen in Lima. A few of these have been published by Westphalen, but only those written after, I think it was 1945. Reading these letters is a moving and very disturbing experience. They are so personal, so passionate, so bitter, and so lucid. They make no secret of the love affair with Antonio, which is probably what kept him so long in Mexico, as well as money problems. It's curious that after Morrow's death, Westphalen denied to later researchers like Jason Wilson that he knew of his homosexuality. And this was probably a protective move, both of himself and the reputation of Morrow, at a time when it was not only still widely unacceptable socially, but legally criminal. But the letters also reveal the extent of Morrow's engagement in promoting and defending surrealism, and then in questioning it. And I will argue that Morrow's time at the heart of the Surrealist Collective in Paris between 1928 and 1933 was the defining experience of his life, and that he hoped to renew the Surrealist community in Mexico during the Second World War. And this was not to do with the pursuit of power on his part, but with the ideal of living in a community of like-minded writers and artists. The dream collapsed when Breton stayed in New York and started his own review there, Triple V. But Moreau had an abiding commitment to some of Surrealism's core beliefs, to poetry lived, and the power of desire. So reading these letters, one fears that one is poking an illegitimate nose into very private concerns. Did he mean them for publication? Probably not. He couldn't even get his poems published. But I think he had a different attitude to the question of private and public altogether. Transparency in life, and a refusal to separate life and work were core surrealist ideas. Writing, poetry, is not a career, it is life. May you live poetry. In a letter to Westphalen in February 1940, just after the opening of the International Surrealist Exhibition in Mexico City, Morrow wrote, I must draw up a resume of all the idiocies the Mexican press has said about surrealism. And we must put some surrealist slogans in visible places, such as, a bas le travail, down with work, which I particularly like and was basic for my adhesion to surrealism. A guerre au travail, a war on work, or down with work, was one of several watchwords on the cover of the first of the surrealist journals, La Révolution Surrealiste. Uh, this is number four, July 1925, the year Moreau arrived in Paris from Lima to try to make his name as an artist. In the editorial of that issue, why I'm taking over the editorship of La Révolution Surrealiste, André Breton gives an impassioned summary of the position of surrealism. It's barely a year since the movement was founded, and much is already expected and feared of their revolution. The traps of literary celebrity, or the literary alibi, are to be avoided at all costs. While it is crucial as far as the exterior is concerned that their enterprise make no tactical mistake, it is nonetheless true that there are internal divergences of opinion which, Breton goes on, could one day paralyze them. What is surrealism anyway, he asks? Is it a form of absolute opposition or an ensemble of purely theoretical propositions or a system based on the confusion of all systems? 
or the first stone of a new social structure. According to each individual's response, each will offer surrealism what he can. We are not afraid of contradiction. Close quotes. In 1928, which is probably the year he made contact with the surrealists, Morrow wrote a poem that remained unpublished, Abajo el Trabajo, Down with Work. In a flow of puns on clothes and work, taking prendas de vestir, uh, talents as a starting point, Morrow affirms his opposition to the capitalist work ethic and methods of production, to the commercialization of art and the sale of talents. The prostitution of writing to journalism was anathema to surrealism and the cause of several expulsions from the movement at the time of the Second Manifesto in 1929. An abnegation of work as a form of resistance taps into a key aspect of the experience of modernity. It is a kind of refusal, both of capitalist control and of progressive mechanization and automation. What is the value of the human being? Surrealist automatism itself is split between the dissolution of the individual and its deep revelation. Morrow himself was committed to automatism, though not in a dogmatic way. Disagreeing with Victor Serge, who claimed that Breton never wrote automatic poems, Morrow responded angrily, to quote Jason Wilson, that Breton's poems always remained in the free zone, close to automatic writing, as did Perret, Éluard, Char, and Zara. His poems, like Breton's, tingle with dense and startling images that are persuasively unpremeditated. And while the letters are in no sense rehearsals for the poems, they can move suddenly into the same heightened region of expression about an impossible love. I just got a tiny bit from one of the letters. To know that everything is against your love, against the very reason for living, when you recognize a being as destined for you, whom your blood claims, whom you name in your sleep, and it goes on to all the reasons uh, why the love is so strong. Uh, the Scandalous Life of César Moreau, uh, the title of this little uh, anthology of translated poems uh, in English, it's not an auto autobiographical confession, but it's the title of a poem. The scandal is the fate of the poet lover. In a flood of vivid surrealist images figuring dispersal, darkness, and illicit love. I just quote a few lines. Disperse me in the rain or in the steam of cloudbursts passing at the edge of the night in which we see ourselves through running clouds, which appear to the eyes of lovers who leave their mighty castles blood-turreted, ice-turreted, staining the ice, ripping the leap of late returns. I'm not going to try and say what, what that might mean, but uh, I think it's very interesting contrast between the desire for dissolution, uh, disappearance, self-disappearance, and the very vivid, concrete flood of, of images in the poem. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on some key aspects of his activities and argue that from the point of leaving France to return to Lima in 1933 um, until 1942, he felt charged with representing, defending, and propagating surrealism in Latin America. And he experimented with many forms of visual expression and in some ways tried to unlearn his early expertise. And I, unfortunately, I don't really have um, in, enough yet. We, we, we're trying to sort of build up more in the way of a, of a picture of his pictures and his interventions in the visual field. Um, I, I have a few that I would wish, but uh, we'll look at a few of them. I mean, he tried collage as well as painting um, and, uh, uh, and drawing as, and, and uh, painting in a deliberately ma naive manner. Now, this is an unpublished manuscript notebook, which he uh, started creating on his return to Lima, dedicated, as you can see, to Breton and Eluard, um, with the uh, endless admiration of César Moreau, Lima, 7th of June, 1934. The drawings in this book, and he seems to have... Um, sorry, just go on a moment. Um, uh, he seems to have sort of planned it, as it were, as, uh, hoping that it would be published virtually as a facsimile, as such. Now, the drawings he made here have a very interesting relationship to uh, Dali's drawing from Violette Nozière, uh, which is called Paranoiac Portrait of Violette Nozière. Um, Dali's head in this drawing is distorted through a kind of anamorphosis, that is a, dis a, a distortion of perspective, with an elongated cranium, nose, and eyelashes. Uh, the individual elements then taking on other identities, as in a kind of Archimboldo doubled image. 
Ähm, and the, the forms, I think, in, in Dali's drawing, a really interesting mixture of hard and soft, as if they're compressed by space, and the very flaccid breasts and the bony brow. I mean, you know, half it's hard, half it's soft, but it, they're recognizable as forms. I think Moro's drawings, though I, I, I believe that they were quite directly influenced by, uh, by the Dali drawing. Uh, we know that Moro received the, the book, Violet Nazaire, which he published actually after he left Paris, but he received it in, uh, in 1934. And um, I'll just show you a few of the drawings. Um, this one, which, which has, a, has a face. Um, it's, a, it's a curious creature flying through the sky. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's very interesting how, how much more abstract Moro's line is than that of Dali. And I think that they spin really more like automatic drawings across the page. And I, th I think that, that they... They're very sort of strikingly um, different and slightly more decorative, perhaps, than, uh, than Dali's. And this is a particularly interesting, uh, almost clay-like uh, automatic drawing. But they do remind one, I think, a little bit of Moreau's earliest, very refined and expert Art Nouveau style. Um, this is the cover of the facsimile of El de la Fabre, but dated 1921. And you can see this sort of elongated, very decorative style of Moro's earliest um, visual things. So on his return to Lima, faced with an utterly retrograde art scene and fueled by his recent time at the heart of discussions about surrealism and painting, photography and film, about the surrealist object and so on, Moro took a drastically negative view about art. In Paris, the surrealist's attitudes to art and he shared in these, were sophisticated if ambivalent. The early 30s were the period of maximum insistence in the Surrealist group on the supersession of art altogether, combined paradoxically with extraordinary new directions in painting. Paintings and anti-paintings, aggressive collages, ready-mades and the Surrealist object, all were in the process of helping to overturn the Dada veto on art by consecrating some of its own strategies as potent modes of expression and adding new ones. Automatism, chance, the found object, the found natural object and so on, were filling out an entirely new arena of visual expression as a counter to modernism. For Moro, returning to a place where cubism, let alone anything more radical, was barely heard of, must have been a bitter shock. His anger and frustration at the conditions of life, art, and love in Peru probably explained the title of a text he wrote shortly after his return from Paris and that remained unpublished in his lifetime, Los Antiochos de Osufre, Sulfur Goggles. Sulfur Goggles, something painful to the sight or that burns up what is in front of it. He condemns all art in Peru with the exception of two things. The texts, objects, and pictures of the mad in the lunatic asylum of the hospital at uh, LH Luego, mm -hmm. and a monument in Lima to Petit and I don't have a picture of this, which he describes in terms drawn from Dali as the inexhaustible, magnificent, delirious, palpitating, and obscene illustration of the castration complex. Moro possessed several works by the aliene of the hospital, uh, of which this is one here, um, and uh, where he worked as curator of the Museo de Obras de los Enfermos. And he said, they're exceptional people from whom we have so much to learn, as he later wrote to the Chilean surrealist Gomez Correa, and whom he had the luck to know and to treat. And Moro's own paintings at this time seemed to aspire to the condition of unselfconscious, direct, and rudimentary expressiveness. Sulfur goggles was unfinished. Um, I'll just show you another of these. Um, I, th I think this shows a knowledge of some very, very early, early 17th century um, sort of Inca Spanish text. And this is another of the examples of the works that Moro himself collected from, uh, from the lunatic asylum in Lima. So Sulfur Goggles was unfinished, though Moro probably intended to publish it as a tract promoting surrealism, possibly an introduction to an anthology of surrealist poetry. Uh, and I quote, the beautiful, deadly bomb, surrealism, will reach this sad provincial place, sordid as an empty barrel. Sulfur Goggles also contains guarded, but still quite transparent references, not just to love, but to sexuality, 
a sexuality at odds with the heterosexual norm of this very conservative society. Love, he complains, is reduced to marriage and virginity. This subject uh, then erupts again in Sulphur Goggles in connection with the Spanish translation of the title of a recent painting of Dali's. It's likely that Moro had by now received a copy of Dali's Conquest of the Irrational, where this painting is reproduced, and you see it here. It's called Atmospheric Skull, Sodomizing a Grand Piano. And this had been rendered in Spanish translation as Skull Trying to Fertilize a Grand Piano. <laughs> and, since when, writes Moreau, has sodomy, admirably sterile, served to propagate the species, grand piano or whatever? <laughs> uh, Moreau organized the first serious exhibition in uh, Latin America in Lima in 1935. The vast majority of the works were by Moreau himself, paintings, drawings, and collages. And, and you, you, this is the cover with one of the paintings on, by Morrow on the front, which I think actually shows some of this desire to unlearn. I mean, it's a, it's a deliberately rough painting, a very, a very sort of crude and direct and rudimentary one, very striking. Um, but also notice, please, the, uh, the title of the future magazine already planned in 35, El Uso de la Palabra, also on the, uh, the outside cover of this exhibition catalogue. Um, Morrow's works uh, exhibited included such titles as The Abominable Color Green and Mini Automatic Texts. The Cannibal Eye Above the Sky Seeks a Nude Eye, Plaster Nose, a Nude Sky, Born of Plaster, the Petrels Shining Far Away in the Menacing Granite of Delirium. The catalogue flaunted quotations insulting the public, such as Picabia's Art is a Pharmaceutical Product for Imbeciles, which you see here. Um, and aphorisms from, from, from Picabia, from the old Dadaist, were mixed with quotations from surrealists such as Crevel, Dali, Aragon, Breton. Dada wrecking tactics are also evident in Moreau's unsigned introductory text, which, rather than announcing the new enterprise of surrealism, lays into the local art scene and a society and culture in Peru that was taking on more and more, he said, the horrific color of a church at dusk. This exhibition shows for the first time in Peru, I'm quoting, a collection of unchosen works intended to provoke scorn and the anger of the people whom we despise and detest. They're against painting and against any claim made for art. And um, I think I, I'll have to cut the next bit, but it, it, he also goes on to make a blistering attack on Vicente Huidobro, who's one of the most prominent of the Latin American intellectuals and poets uh, active at the time. And it, 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 it was a, a sort of um, a bloodletting exercise. Um, in, uh, while he was in, back in Lima, uh, as Kent Dixon has, has, has um, described so clearly in his thesis, Morrow and Westphalen joined, uh, were, were engaged in political activities, um, joined a cell of intellectuals, and founded the Comité de Amigos de los Defensores de la República Española, CADRE, and published a pamphlet. Um, protesting at the uh, support for fascism by the Peruvian government and the, at, the, uh, um, at the annulment of national elections. And as a result, Westphal was arrested and Moro fled to Mexico. And from Mexico, he continued to work with Westphalen on the long-planned review, El Uso de la Palabra. And here, this, where you see this double page spread from Minotaur, surrealism around the world, there is the back of the catalogue uh, the, um, of the exhibition announcing El Uso de la Palabra. Unfortunately, um, just after uh, it, it appeared in 1939, a review appeared in Paris with the same name, and obviously Moreau and Westphalen had planned um, that, it should be, that it should continue as a review, there should be other issues. And Moreau wrote to Westphalen, we'll have to change the title. Um, although we thought of it first, will be accused of plagiarism again. Um, and moreover, he didn't want to be associated with this review, which gathered all the dissident surrealists together, people who were en froid avec Breton, who were, who were not um, being approved at the time by Breton. The layout uh, was unfortunately rather awkward and inelegant, the typography rather boring, this is Moreau's view, and the photographs that he had chosen and sent with great care and some satisfaction at their subversive character were badly reproduced. He had commissioned his friend, Eva Sulzer, to photograph a nude sculpture. 
you can see it here in the magazine, and I quote, it's a very lovely and obscene statue in the main gardens of the Avenida Juarez. I think this photograph and the Lola Alvarez Bravo photograph of an Indian which, uh, which appears above the beginning of Moro's article called About Painting in Peru were intended to signify in their own right uh, rather than as mere illustrations. And there, there are actually two photographs of Indian women. I'm using the term Indian because that's what was used at the time. I know it's a problem, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm using it anyway. Uh, photographs by Lola Alvarez Bravo and by uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo are reposts against the indigenous painting that Morrow describes as odious and spreading like a virulent plague uh, in Peru. Such picturesque images as Sabogal's Indian mayor, which you see here on the left, are examples, and I'm paraphrasing, of the real cruelty with which the great misery of the indigenous peoples, their complete ostracism and exploitation, is traduced on canvas or on the pottery knickknacks sold to tourists. Like Mariategui in his magazine Amauta, although with less faith in social and political reform, Moreau contrasts the picturesque with the actuality of the Indian and I quote, who works tirelessly in implacable climates with a pathetic handful of maize for food or drowns in the refuge of cocaine and alcohol. The fashion for indigenism is, moreover, paired with ignorance of history. The indigenous painters and their collectors are conscious only of the Inca period and know nothing of the ancient and highly refined coastal civilizations, preferring, he says, if anything, coastal primitivism, such as possessions of our Lord of the Miracles. Inverting the values usually ascri ascribed to primitive or refined, uh, sorry, primitive and refined or civilized, um, equating Western Catholicism, our Lord of the Miracles, and making that primitive by contrast with the Nazca or Moche civilizations, recalls Bataille's strategy in the magazine Document. The radical challenge to the hierarchy of values that invariably placed Western civilizations at the summit of human achievement took, in document, a harsher edge than in the core surrealist magazines such as La Révolution Surréaliste. But unlike Bataille, Moreau feels absolutely no existential anguish at the absence of God and the absence of myth in the modern world. The past that haunts him is the physical remains, the art, the walls, the stones of the pre-Columbian civilizations. He has no illusions about a revival, but he honors, and I quote, their exemplary art, which, like the decapitated head of an animal, does not cease to threaten with the terrible power of its dreams, the miserable reality that surrounds and spoils it. In the poetic essay on the Corricantia, published in Din in December 1943, Moreau meditates more directly on the echoes, oh, right. <laughs> Sorry, of the wonderful past. And I will just skip here a little bit um, to the, uh, the International Exhibition of Surrealism of 1940, um, where in the, in, in, the, in the preface, Morrow talks about a new heavenly combustion in Mexico, sort of bringing together the pre-Columbian civilizations and the fire of international surrealism. Um, and he clearly really hoped at this point, this is the cover, uh, this is a sentence, a paragraph from the, from the catalogue that was uh, censored, actually, uh, censored by the gallery, Gallery of Modern Art uh, in, in Mexico City, uh, where Morrow talks about the end of the Christian era. And that was taken out as regarded as too offensive for the, for the public. Um, and then he quotes the uh, cover of another uh, issue, La Révolution sur les Liste, with the 1925 end of the Christian era. He says, it's better to remember that in 1939. Um, and this is one of the works, I, I thought it's very interesting to, to compare one of the photographs of Morrow, quite famous photographs of him, very, almost like a sort of collage in sand, as if he's drowning in sand, with the Graciela Aranis Brignoni, which was exhibited in the 1940s show. Um, and just a show, picture of Morrow in the exhibition. Uh, letters from Morrow to Westphalen complain bitterly about the fuss that Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo made, insisting on being given the best places. And you can see 
there's Rivera's painting there, and Carlo's of the, uh, the two Fridas at the back. Um, they spent all their time making these gigantic pictures, especially for it, although having no claim at all really to be surrealist. Um, well, I, I just want to, to end um, with sort of roughly the end of the story, um, of this particular story, uh, which is that in 1940-41, Moro undoubtedly expected surrealism to be reborn in Mexico. Uh, he writes, uh, we must snatch the surrealists from the hell in Europe, write to all officials and intellectuals, but on no account mention surrealism. They must get Breton and Mabi to Mexico, Eloi and Perret to Lima. In June 1941, he noted that Breton would certainly come to live in Mexico. Uh, and Mata and Anzo Ford would come too. They'd join Palen, Raon, Perret and others as a nucleus of a reborn group. And I think when this failed to happen and Breton settled in New York, started his other review, VVV, uh, Moro really was uh, quite disappointed. And he, you, you can see that he begins in his letters to say, well, I don't know what direction to take now. Um, really, the, the illustrative side of surrealism is over. We can't repeat what was happening before the war. There must be something new, but I don't know what it's going to be. Um, I'm going to skip to the very end. Um, his review of Arcan is is quite uh, is, is quite strong. It's quite critical, um, and he criticizes Breton's um, way that the celebration of love has become quite formulaic, and uh, he criticizes its very limited recognition of human desire. The insistence that every human being seeks the unique being of the opposite sex is complementary. Fine, Morris says, if this is meant allegorically, but it is not here. Um, so that combination of disappointment with that book, with disappointment at the failure of the Surrealists to come and live in Mexico and really relive Surrealism there, um, I think left Moro quite isolated, uh, perhaps with a, with a freedom and independence he hadn't had before. And I just quote from one of his letters. Th th this is Moro with Esteban Frances on the left and on the right, um, possibly, I don't, probably in Mexico, I'm not sure. Um, and one of, from one of his letters, he says, I would like to do nothing, just read and paint. <laughs>